we shall gather at the river with each other. Cause you're my brother. And if I so put in the water for the healing of each other. first day of our pilot project when we were getting into the housing business and we moved I think it was five people into apartments one Saturday and it was a great day and we were all excited and they were excited about moving into their apartments uh, but then on Monday one of the women in the program Helen came to me and asked me, did you notice it rained yesterday? And I said, oh yeah, I guess maybe it did. And she said, I didn't get wet. And I thought, okay, we're doing the right thing. Now clearly, the program is bigger than that. It's more, much more complex than that, but just Helen saying, I didn't get wet. I sat in my living room looking out the window at the rain thinking, I'm not getting wet. I knew right then we were doing the right thing. Because we can. Because we can. We're going to uh, William Phillips' job. Um, He's one of the guys that made contact actually with the uh, urban ministry, asked him for some assistance. And he was uh, working on uh, three years clean and sober, but he was still living up on the bridge. So he knew uh, the holidays were, were coming up and he needed some extra help to remain clean and sober and he was looking for housing. I started drinking when I was about 14 years old. When I turned to alcohol, well, up in my 20s, that's when I just started totally losing control. I stayed under the bridge for about two, about two or three years. Uh, just drinking and then and, and trying to survive for day from day to day. It was dark, full of beer bottles, dirty, cold. It, it, it was horrible. It was, it, it, I wouldn't wish that on nobody. I had to stay drunk just to live that. Alcohol took the fear from me. I didn't have nowhere to turn to, nowhere to go, but I just had somebody to talk to me and, and tell me that I wasn't alone in this thing, that I could beat it. it. It gave me a little confidence. I had to want to make that change. Any program or anybody who I felt he could benefit from, I tried to put them in his life to make sure that he had what he needed to get out from up under that bridge. I was still out there on that bridge and every day I always thought, well, I go get me a drink. But I knew that if I didn't stop somewhere and listen to what they was telling me, how to get help, you know, I was, I, I was going to die out there. I was going to die on that bridge. And every time I would talk to Mr. Brown, he said, how you doing, William? I said, 
man, I'm struggling. He said, I know it. But he said, you know, if you keep struggling like you're doing and doing the things you're doing, things will start to change for you. And it did. It did. The last year of my life has been the best year of my life. Learning how to live clean and sober again. It's a bridge. At one time, there was a lot of us up under there, but we all call it the dungeon. That was our home. I saw her in the lunch line, and I just went out and told her who I was and asked her if she could come see me for a couple minutes so we could talk about housing. We went and had lunch and got to know each other, and I don't know, I kind of fell in love <laughs> that lunch. We became pretty close after that. God beat me. I was in a coma. And then when I come out of it, I've had epilepsy since then. Brenda has expressed a sense of, I know I am worthy of, of more, and I am worthy of a place to live, of stability, of safety. And for someone who has struggled with, with being the victim of violence, um, I think that that's really powerful. When I told her that she had gotten the place, and I told Brenda, and we walked, and she was noticeably happy, but, um, when we hit the uh, sidewalk, she just sobbed. Brenda has only lived at Moore Place for a couple of weeks, um, but the smile that was on her face the day that she moved in was just astounding. Um, she just really was grinning from ear to ear, and you could see how excited she was about no longer being outside, about being inside. Um, you know, Brenda is someone who has been the victim of domestic violence, and for her to be in a home that is safe, that is stable, that is secure, uh, I think is really gonna be game changing for her. I thank God every day. Every day I walk through the door when I turn that key. I mean, you know, that's a feeling, that's a feeling nobody can take. I grew up in a alcoholic family. I experienced several all kinds of abuse. It was normal to me to they be around drunks or people using drugs. Being around violence was normal. I've had a long history of incarceration. It was a revolving door in and out, in and out. I got clean at the age of 49, went to school, barber school at the age of 50, 
And at the age of 53, I'm a licensed barber. And I got a lot of gratitude for a lot of different people in my life. Right now, the most important is scattered sites for housing me because if it wasn't for housing, I don't think any of, any of the things I accomplished would have materialized. I'd just been another addict back out on the street, probably committing another crime. The thing that impresses me about Wayne is how determined he was to get his life back on track. He had a lot of obstacles in terms of obtaining his barber's license, um, a lot of things from his past that uh, potentially could have halted his dream of becoming a barber, and he was very adamant that he was not gonna let that happen. Um, and with the support of his case manager, with the support of other staff at Urban Ministry Center, um, he was able to overcome those hurdles, and a lot of persistence on his part. I think he is someone who is very forward-looking and isn't about looking back. The very first time I met him, we were actually closed, and I was in here reupholstering re the barber seats. At first, I was kind of reluctant, because I was like, well, you, you kind of, over the hill, this, like to be starting out as a barber. And I could not be more pleased. Wayne is actually an amazing guy. He's turning out to be a great barber. He has great values, great morals. He understands, he listens. That's the main thing. And um, I'm, it's just a joy to have him. Wayne is almost like an open book when it comes to the things that he's been through. I was addicted to any drug that make me be somebody other than me. You know, all of my normal thoughts always took me back to my childhood. It was just terrible. The environment in which you grow up, you actually, you become a part of that. When everybody is neighbors and everybody does the same thing and you never leave that rim, then anything outside of what you used to as a child in that rim is alien. To go somewhere where ain't nobody using, ain't nobody drinking, ain't nobody drunk, ain't nobody fighting, ain't nobody cursing. And it's something you have to stop back and look at and you got to figure out what the hell is wrong with these people. And so when you, you grow up with that concept, you grow up with that mentality. And it don't take long for a prison to become a revolving door for you. You, know, you just don't take long to be done lost your life or you done took someone else's life. And because those are the things you know. I don't need nobody to tell me how far I've come. You know, I don't. I just, you know how you can pat yourself on the back? I can do that, because I know I'm grateful. I thought I was going to die on the street. I was homeless for three years. And I turned to drinking and, and I, I was about to give up. I mean, it just, it, once you become homeless, then the road is open for all kinds of alcohol, drugs, everything. Because they never been one of the best teachers around. So here was all this talent going to waste on the kind of drugs. I attended my sister and her husband's wedding anniversary. One of his former teachers, his co-workers was there. 
And she's got him say, Carl Caldwell is the best teacher in the whole wide world. The whole wide world. This is your best teacher right here, Carl Caldwell. Everybody wanted to call for the teacher. And he gave plays at the end of the year. Every year he'd give a play. And a car load of us would go up from Landis to, to Maryland. And when he gave his plays, he danced. He would come out on stage and dance with the kids. Oh, he would dance with the kids. I lost a lot of family. She never gave up. She prayed, she stayed on her knees. Once I got this place, she said, I can finally get off my knees. We did all we could to help him. Talk to him, talk to him, talk to him, prayed for him. I told him I prayed my knees off two or three times. It was horrible. It was something I, I didn't want, I was ashamed and I didn't, my family didn't even know it. They didn't know it, they found out about a year before I moved into more place. If you meet Carl Frank, you see he's got that very effervescent personality and that very bubbly personality. Uh, and then you can contrast that with what his life had been before. Um, again, uh, many years of homelessness, struggling with addiction, um, and struggling with serious physical conditions. Um, Carl Frank was diagnosed with cancer while he was homeless. And while he was uh, homeless and, and living with a cancer diagnosis, he was getting all of his cancer care in the ER. In the one year before he moved into more place, he went to the emergency room 61 times. 61 times in one year. I, I can't imagine knowing I have a cancer diagnosis and trying to wrap my mind around that and trying to, to cope with, with what that must bring emotionally and then know, and the only way I'm gonna get treated and even try and manage this or potentially beat it is by going to the ER. I think of this place as saving my life. More place saved my life. Since living at More Place, he was able to get sustained care, uh, the regular care that you or I might get for, um, for cancer diagnosis, and now his cancer is in remission. I am a happy person. I get up fired up, energetic. Everybody kept saying, I'll really give up. He's gonna be homeless, he's gonna be no good. We have lost the real car. People just, cause they knew what I was like before this. She's the only one who never gave up on me. The other thing that's been a joy to watch for Carl Frank is um, his reconnection with family. Um, he has a, a wall in his apartment that are all the cards that he's gotten from his family. Um, and he didn't move in with that wall of cards. That's my wall of love, people who, who just have supported me like crazy. I mean, that wall of cards has evolved over the past 18 months, and the number of family members he has brought to more place, the number of family members I've had the privilege to meet, um, is just astounding. And the fact that he's been able to make those reconnections and rebuild those relationships with his family, I think speaks again to the power of Housing First. Someone who meant everything to me. She was, you know, my father, she was my brother, my sister, she was everything. And I was on my way to school one day and found my mother dead. 
My grandmother, she would always tell me, be careful, you know, choose your friends and make sure you, uh, you know, uh, go down the right path. Of course, I didn't listen. And it caused me a lot of headache, it caused me a lot of heartache, it caused me some time away. It also caused me the miserable life of being homeless. I couldn't get jobs, I couldn't get uh, no housing, and I was just wanting to give up. When I was volunteer coordinator at Urban Ministries, um, we would do these panels, and that's where I met Mark. He would always be my go-to guy because his story was so interesting. People um, were touched by just how real he was and genuine. I just love his personality. I mean, I love, he's just, he's fun and he's, he is who he is. And Joe had asked Mark to do a panel um, on like a Sunday evening. So <laughs> I, I got to go with her and I met him. And immediately, you know, he's just, he's upbeat, you know, for all that he's been through. He's just a very, um, optimistic, you know, kind of a, a great spirit to be around. He'd come in the office and so then I would try to get him to, you know, do other things, go back to school or do stuff and then invite him over and I don't know, it just kind of became part of the When I would call them, the first thing they would ask me is, Mark, how are you doing? How's everything going? That made me feel like I wasn't alone anymore. At the end of the day, we all really need to be loved and to know that we're loved. You know, I'll never forget, I was, uh, we was having a party, my birthday party, they always have a party. But the younger sister, younger daughter, which is Rachel, she, uh, she got a phone call during the birthday party. And, uh, she says, well, not right now, I'm at my brother's birthday party. That changed my whole life. That changed the part of my life that made me feel like somebody do care. That made me feel like, you know, I have a purpose for life. I felt like that I could, I am somebody, that people do love you. This, the Risers, they are, that's my family. For all the good stuff we were doing, feeding people, giving them emergency shelter in the winter, uh, providing a place to, you know, take a shower, do laundry, all those things are essential to a process of building relationships. But the fact of the matter is, lives are changed through housing. People's health is improved through housing. Housing really is the game changer that sets aside uh, all the things that we thought we knew about homeless people and now creates a whole new vision of what's possible. Now it's something that's going to be solved. Uh, it's, it's not a dream that's too big. It really is a strategy that works. And so if we can serve as a pointer toward another future, you know, we can be human billboards of hope. Uh, you know, here's the way out. Here's, here's, what, future, here's what your future could look like. Um, that's a pretty powerful service to provide. There's no reason why we can't end chronic homelessness because we, know we have the right strategy. It's a matter of rallying the community in the same way they rallied around us to build more place in the midst of a recession. Uh, we need to rally the community again and stay after it until we end chronic homelessness. Because we can. Because we can.